When average Californians pull into their neighborhood gas station and see this, there's little question how they feel. Well, there are those with a decidedly different take. In some ways, I hope that uh, the price of oil stays high. Meet Jay Kiesling, a science rock star, if there is such a thing. Kiesling is a synthetic biologist, part genetic engineer, part molecular biologist, part chemist. He's the chief executive officer of the new Joint Bioenergy Institute, or JBay. For Kiesling, higher oil prices mean more interest in biofuel. The Joint Bioenergy Institute was formed to investigate all aspects of turning cellulosic biomass into biofuels. Cellulosic biomass. It's a mouthful, but don't be intimidated. It's basically a generic term for plant matter. And for many scientists, the energy locked up in this organic material represents the ultimate next generation source for renewable fuels. So what is this energy and how do you get it? If you think about a plant, it's really sugar that makes up a large fraction of the plant, maybe half of the plant material. What we're trying to do overall is break that plant cell wall back down into sugars and then take the sugars and turn them into fuels. Very simple process. Simple and universal. Animals extract energy from the cellulose of plants. That energy, which originally came from the sun, is stored by plants in huge sugar molecules that make up plants' cell walls. When we eat the plant matter, our digestive systems break it down to the sugars we process for energy. Biofuel scientists are interested in breaking down cellulose in the same way. They want to process feedstocks, simple plants like switchgrass or even leftover corn stalks, into sugars and ferment those sugars into fuel. So when you put that fuel in your car, you burn it, you produce carbon dioxide. That same carbon dioxide then comes back into the next generation of plants. On the other hand, burning petroleum releases carbon that's been locked away deep underground, increasing the amount of carbon in the atmosphere and contributing to global warming. That's one reason why cellulosic fuel research is so hot right now. Need proof? In February of 2007, British Petroleum offered UC Berkeley a $500 million grant for biofuels research, the biggest such award ever made to a university. And JBay, funded by $125 million from the Department of Energy, promises to be another epicenter. JBay's concept is to house numerous research teams from academia and industry under one roof. We want to speed up the pace of research, and that means improving communications. Rather than waiting for a phone call across the country to talk to your colleague, go to the next bench. Tell them your result. But why go to all this expense when we already have a working solution? Ethanol, derived from corn, is already available, and in some states accounts for 10% of what you put in your car. Well. Corn ethanol is made from corn kernels, which stresses a potential food supply. It takes lots of energy to make, and it provides lower mileage than gasoline per gallon. And there are other problems. You can't transport it through traditional pipelines because it picks up water along the way. You have to use trucks and train cars. So we really looked at this and said, we really need next generation biofuels things that will behave like the gasoline, that we can use the traditional infrastructure and the automobiles that we've invested in. And there's trillions of dollars of infrastructure that we've already built around this hydrocarbon-based economy. The first step in accomplishing this goal is to find or design a plant or feedstock that can be produced in huge amounts at low cost. And then you have to break down their sugars for fuel fermentation. Plants have evolved to protect the sugars in those cell walls. Uh, they don't want other organisms coming in, like beetles, like uh, microbes, chewing them up and getting access to those sugars. So they built protection. These sugars are strung together in long polymers. So these polymers actually make it insoluble so that it isn't dissolved by water so readily. These insoluble sugars need to be broken down into simpler sugars that can be fermented into fuel. One way to do this is to use natural enzymes found in microbes the world over. In the lab, this step is called deconstruction. 
Dr. Blake Simmons of Sandia National Labs heads up J-Bay's efforts. One potential deconstruction machine is a microbe called sulfolobus. It breaks down cellulose, and it already thrives in environments that are as inhospitable as the inside of a commercial refinery. Sulfolobus is a very interesting bug. Um, the fact that it grows in a sulfuric environment and, and performs metabolic functions very efficiently in that environment make it very intriguing from several standpoints. From a biorefining standpoint, if you can run things at conditions that are um, hotter and more extreme, you don't have to worry so much about contamination. Okay. Simmons and his team have already made significant strides in the deconstruction process. Here, you see the results of one of their experiments. The breakdown of the plant's cell walls is easy to see. From here, the resulting sugar soup would be handed off to Dr. Kiesling's fuel synthesis team. Like the deconstructors, Kiesling's fermenters are betting on microbes. Through the centuries, we've cultivated microbes to turn sugars into ethanol. Uh, ethanol is not the best fuel. We'd like to produce molecules, fuels, that look like the 91 octane, for instance, that you put in your gas tank. But microbes don't produce them naturally, so we have to trick them into doing this. We've chosen E. coli and yeast as the organisms of choice for doing this fuel production process because they're the best known organisms out there. E. coli and yeast have been the workhorses for the pharmaceutical and the biotechnology industries. We're going to make use of all of that knowledge that's accumulated over the years. In order to redesign a yeast or E. coli microbe, changing it so it eats sugars and excretes fuel, synthetic biologists like Kiesling use two methods, metabolic engineering and directed evolution. In our bodies, we take in sugar, and that sugar is then turned into protein and fats um, that make up our body. Metabolism is responsible, it's the chemistry that takes that sugar and turns it into proteins and fats. Metabolic engineering is engineering that chemistry that naturally goes on inside the cell to try to change it to get it to do what you want it to. Synthetic biologists build a new microbe almost the way you might build a machine. They recombine genetic parts so that the resulting new microbe excretes the desired material. We can reuse those parts for many purposes for engineering biology. Making a fuel, making a cheap drug, making a chemical, say biodegradable carpet fibers. But this kind of direct metabolic engineering can only take you part of the way. To go the rest of the way, they use a process called directed evolution. In directed evolution, you evolve the cell. You don't know specifically what change you want to make, but you force the cell to make mutations in the gene, and then you find the cell that does the correct mutation that you want. With evolution, you've got to screen through millions of solutions to find the right one. It's like finding a needle in a haystack, if you will. We tend to use directed evolution and metabolic engineering together. You recombine the parts and you get 90% there with metabolic engineering. And then we use evolution to fine tune it. And the combination of the two is actually works extremely well. In a fermenter like this, Kiesling's engineered microbes eat simple sugars and excrete biofuel. It's only a beaker full of product, but it is a start. And if all goes according to plan, a small fermenter like this might someday be scaled up to become the heart of a biofuel refinery. Still, all the biofuels news isn't rosy. Some recent studies suggest that creating biofuels from plants can actually increase greenhouse emissions when the clearing of land and cultivation are taken into account. I don't think there's going to be a single solution to the energy or transportation problems in the United States and the world. I think instead of a silver bullet, we have to take more of a silver shotgun approach that, you know, the 10% solutions, if you have 10, 10% solutions, well, now you've sold, solved 100% of the problem. And so I think it's that diversification, both in perspective and in technology, that is going to be key in making this a reality.